In this lesson, we're going to survey the teachings of Jesus as presented in the four Gospels. Our textbook, uh, Encountering the New Testament, has an interesting section on how to understand Jesus. You always need to understand what someone says or writes in the context in which it is presented. Remember that Jesus spoke his message, all of his messages, and he spoke them in particular circumstances. Jesus did not write his messages. We don't have anything uh, that Jesus wrote. We need to remember also that when he was talking, he was interacting with people in live situations. It wasn't just uh, an address on a radio or, or, or on TV. Jesus was talking with people and the way he talked and what he talked about had to do with the particular situation at the time. Remember also where Jesus lived and the people with whom he lived. Jesus was speaking in a nation of religious people, not only, relig not only religious, but uh, people who, except for those who had migrated in with the various empires, all had the same religion, the Jewish religion. And so Jesus, as he spoke, could assume that the people he addressed accepted basic religious truths. All the people in his area believed in God, uh, most of them believed in angels and miracles. They certainly all believed in scripture, the Hebrew scriptures, which uh, Christians call the Old Testament. Jesus didn't have to lay the groundwork of defining what sin is, or forgiveness, or the providence of God, or God's intervening to rescue or save people. These concepts his listeners already knew. He didn't need to convince people of truths like these. You might today uh, have to take a different approach with someone who didn't believe in God or the Bible or who had not even heard of Christ. In his instance, the words that he speaks are to people who are already religious, already believe in the God of the scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures, and who already know the basics of what's behind what he's saying. You also need to remember that that same audience that we're classifying as believers were people who didn't much want to learn. And finally, in how to understand Jesus, remember that he wasn't just giving information. Jesus was persuading people. He was speaking to call people to commit to the kingdom of God. When we say that Jesus was speaking to people who didn't want to listen, we're talking about people who are complacent, who feel like they've already heard it. They already know what the scriptures say. And yet, they don't do anything because of what they know. It's a situation like you'd see in many churches today. It's not that people don't know, it's that they don't do and it doesn't change them, it doesn't excite them, it doesn't uh, make them closer to God. When Jesus spoke to most of the crowds he addressed and to the individuals he addressed, he was seeking to take people who knew many things about God and knew many things that God had revealed, and he was seeking to make their beliefs personal and to make their faith living. And remember, finally, that Jesus spoke to preach the kingdom of God. The summaries of his work frequently put it that way, that he went to preach the kingdom of God. And as we've mentioned before, we're not talking about a place or political entity. We're talking about the rule of God. His messages call for people to make God's rule real in their lives. He preaches messages that confront and challenge those who would defy God's sovereignty. So to understand Jesus, you need to know 
each situation is particular. It is a spoken message. He can generally assume that people accept the basic teachings of the Old Testament, but that these are people who are not doing anything because of what they know and believe. We need to remember that Jesus is always speaking with a purpose to persuade, to persuade people to submit to the rule of God in their lives. Jesus, as a preacher, uses various forms of language. These are common in the teachings of Jesus. First, that he expressed hidden meaning in common terms. For instance, when someone said that he wanted to follow Jesus, but first he had to take care of burying his father, Jesus responded, let the dead bury the dead. Which of course is puzzling when taken at face value. The dead can't do anything. So a person who heard that, like so many of the statements of Jesus, is being challenged, will you look deeper? Will you see what the meaning was? Don't just take it at face value. Is he talking about it? you're spiritually dead? Uh, is he saying something entirely different? Is it about why are you making excuses? There are hidden meanings in things that Jesus says, sometimes in very plain words. Jesus also uses vivid imagery to make his points. Most people know the saying of Jesus when he's uh, putting down people for being judgmental. He says, you look at the speck in your brother's eye and you got a big old plank in your eye. It's, it, it paints a quick word picture for you. Jesus frequently spoke in paradox to make people think. Here are two examples. He says, whoever wants to save his life must lose it. Or, the first shall be last, and the last first. When he says you have to lose your life if you want to save it, he's asking you again to think deeper. It's memorable, the paradox is memorable, but what does it mean? Well, I hope you and I will continue to explore that the rest of our lives, but he's saying something about if it's all about you, if it's all about preserving you, your, whatever you thought your life was going to be like, uh, then you're not going to have the life eternal because you're all about you. When he says the first shall be last and the last first, surely he's talking about God's opinion of who is standard worldly first and who is in the hereafter first. Jesus, on several occasions, spoke in obviously exaggerated terms. The technical term you know is hyperbole. He seemed sometimes to see the need to shock people or to challenge them. So, in the Sermon on the Mount, when he's saying to get as far away as you can from temptations and tempting situations, he says, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. Of course, he's not telling you to pluck your eye out. He's saying do whatever it takes to get out of a situation that would cause you to sin or to lose your soul. He says, according to Luke, he tells people, you cannot be my disciple unless you hate your family. Not only is that vivid and strong language, it's contrary to what anyone would think, but it is hyperbole. Matthew gives an account where Jesus says, if anyone loves father or mother or children or, or his own life more than me, he's not worthy of me. And surely, that is the meaning of this exaggerated way of saying the same thing that in comparison to your love for Jesus, your love for your family would be hate. Let's look at the broader forms of the message of Jesus. The most 
quickly recognized form of teaching associated with Jesus is the parable. He taught effectively with parables. A parable is like an allegory, not exactly the same. An allegory is a longer, more intricate story where every detail of the story is, is designed to make some point about the spiritual lesson. A good example of that is the Pilgrim's Progress. Parables are shorter. They're just telling a story to illustrate what you're getting at. But like an allegory, a parable suggests deeper lessons. So the parables of Jesus would suggest deeper lessons. But when asked by his disciples to explain why he used parables, Jesus told us why. He says his stories, his parables, would be intriguing to a person who's open to learning more. They would get the point that the story is not just a story, that it, that it teaches a lesson. It, it may not be expressly explained by Jesus. Sometimes he does and sometimes he doesn't. But he's separating the open from the closed people. The same story, a person who was closed-minded and who didn't think they had anything to learn would say, well, that's a neat story, and they would go on. They would ignore the point. And so by using stories, Jesus was uh, reaching to the heart, to the, to the inner being, the spirit, the mind that wants to know right and wrong or doesn't care. And parables would separate those groups. Now, he taught frequently in parables. Uh, I've seen lists that range from 30 parables to 60 parables in the Gospels, um, parables of Jesus. Uh, the, what makes the list so very different is what you're counting as a parable. Uh, a number of things that some put in their list as a parable are really just a, a short um, metaphor, simile, uh, just a part of a longer lesson. It's not really a story. And so... As I look through the different lists, I think the count is about 40 parables of Jesus. And about uh, half of those are mentioned in more than one gospel, so that about 60 times in the gospels you see Jesus telling a parable, and there are about 40 individual parables involved. Jesus used various forms of illustration. He could use an everyday situation, like a work situation, like somebody who's throwing out the seed in his field, that is, sowing the seed. Uh, he could uh, talk about uh, tenant farmers and, and the owner going away, and, and people would understand that. He could be saying, um, look at those flowers out there, as in when he says, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. Uh, one time he's asked about paying taxes to Caesar, and he says, whose picture's on the coin? And they say, Caesar, and he says, well, give Caesar what's his. But you have God, what is his, uh, an object lesson. Jesus would use common sayings, uh, common sayings about the weather. You can discern the signs of the weather. Uh, and he would say, this is what people say. He would talk about common knowledge of what people say is right and wrong. Sometimes he would talk about some established traditions of the elders, but he would use common sayings as a hook to get people to think deeper about subjects. But the most frequent form that Jesus uses in his messages is to quote scripture, or at least to allude to scripture. Remember, of course, that in the time of Jesus, the New Testament hasn't been written. It's it's only now happening. So when we say scripture, we're talking about the Old Testament and its messages. I looked through a very long list from the ESV study Bible of all the times that they say that the New Testament refers to the Old Testament. Out of those, I pulled out just those in the Gospels, and then out of those just in the Gospels, I pulled out the ones that were just spoken by Christ. What I came up with is that there are about 60 times that Jesus is presented as using Scripture to validate his point or to say that he is the fulfillment of Scripture or to call to attention a Scripture that people are not uh, paying attention to or are not giving honor to. 
So about 60 times we find in his uh, different messages that Jesus uses scripture. Of those 60, uh, many are parallel, that meaning they're in more than one gospel, so that you might uh, read uh, a quote from scripture in a situation that Jesus used, and you might read it in Luke, but it's, you've already read it in Matthew. Those are parallel. So about 40 times they're parallel, so that if you were just counting how many times in the gospel you read that Jesus uses scripture, it, it'll be about 100 times but they report about 60 instances. In addition to that, a number that were in the list that I found in the back of the study Bible, I consider to be only allusions to scripture. That is, he was talking in Bible language. He was using language that was used in some texts of the Old Testament, but it's just a phrase here and there. It, it does show an awareness of, of scripture, but it's not exactly proving a point or, or driving home a principle. Uh, based on that scripture. Now of those 20, there are about uh, 10 of them that are repeated in the parallels. One thing that stands out about how Jesus preached is to recognize that Jesus spoke with authority. Our textbook points out that the rabbis of his day would reference various sources. Rabbi Akiba says, but Rabbi Hillel says, some people say, but on the other hand, and that was no authoritative message. But Jesus would say, you've heard you're not supposed to do this, but I say to you. Jesus would speak authoritatively. He, you wouldn't wonder what he thought or what he was saying. In fact, he spoke with authority so much that the description of the people after the Sermon on the Mount is that they were amazed that he spoke with authority and not like the religious leaders that they'd heard before. There's an interesting story towards the end of the Gospels or the end of the life of Christ on earth. And that is uh, when the authorities want to send temple guards to arrest him, stop him from his preaching. They don't. When they come back and their superiors say, why didn't you bring him? Their answer is telling. They say, no man ever spoke like this. Jesus spoke with authority. And Jesus claimed to speak with heaven's authority. He claimed he was giving a divine message of eternal importance. He presented his words as God's words. He claimed that people were going to answer for his words on Judgment Day. So when you read Jesus, he's not just him hawing around and saying maybe this and maybe that. He is clearly saying, this is what I tell you. He's saying, I'm telling you what God told me to tell you. And he's saying, you're gonna answer for this on Judgment Day. Now, what does Jesus teach? Well, Jesus teaches what God is like. It's interesting to look side by side here and the two aspects of God uh, that we're going to detail in, in short. That Jesus presents God as the Father and Jesus presents God as the King and it's the same God. In the left hand column, Jesus presents God as the Father. He's referred to as our Father. And in that role, he knows us. He understands us. He hears us. Beyond that, in the teaching of Jesus, God is the one who delivers us, who provides for us, who guides us, and who forgives us. God is our Father, and yet God transcends all human experience. God is a spirit. He is completely good and true, glorious, perfect, all-wise, all-powerful. All of this Jesus teaches about what God is like. God 
sustains the world, the universe, and the people that he created. All of this is his creation, and he's the one who keeps it going and holds it all together. God, who transcends human experience, is also our Father, who cares about us personally and deeply and interacts with us. Alongside that, Jesus presents God as the King. Remember, the mission of Jesus is preaching the kingdom of God. And so frequently throughout his teachings, you'll see the underlying message that God is sovereign. That means his rule is the rule. God is presented as working according to his plan. He has one and he'll work it out in his time. And in this, he is at work establishing his kingdom, not an organization, not a political entity, not a geographically defined uh, place of, uh, uh, of abode, his kingdom. He is working to establish his rule. This rule of God is spiritual and it is heavenly. It is much more than political Israel, as much as people of his day may have wanted that. Jesus taught that the kingdom is something different entirely. Jesus taught that God's kingdom is his rule within his people. And Jesus presents God's kingdom as his rule in the people he saves. That is, he is ruling in people who come to him as penitent believers. And coming to God on his terms, those people are redeemed, transformed, reborn. They are now devoted to Jesus and devoted to God's will. These are his people. These are the members, the subjects in his kingdom. And very interestingly, the teaching of Jesus is that God's kingdom is now and is to come. That is, it's starting now as he is speaking. It is now as, as we live. But it's also going to be more. It is going to be eternal. Jesus teaches about God but he also teaches who he himself is. There's a well-known uh, collection of sayings in the Gospel of John, we've mentioned it once before, that is a way in which Jesus describes his relationship to people, the I am statements in John. These statements present Jesus as the ultimate answer to people's needs. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the living bread. I am the light of the world. Jesus says, I am from above. I'm not from down here in this world where you're from. Jesus says, I am the gate for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. On a high spiritual plane, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He also says, I am the way and the truth and the life. He says, metaphorically, I am the true vine, that if you abide in me, you'll bear much fruit. So, as he teaches about himself and what he's here to do, he is the ultimate source for meeting people's needs expressed in all of these uh, literary figures. But his is also a message that points people to their eternal reward or punishment. Jesus presents himself as the one who will grant eternal reward to those who do the will of the Father. He also presents himself as the one who will refuse and disavow 
those who do not serve the Lord in the right way, those who do not do the will of the Father, and he will condemn them forever. Jesus makes it clear who he is to anyone who will listen to his words. He presents himself as the suffering servant of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah set up this figure, this undefined figure, although it had a meaning in a different age, the one that Jesus fully fleshes out, he fulfills, the one who sacrifices himself for the people's sins. Jesus saw himself in many ways and presented himself in many ways as the fulfillment of prophecy, nothing more so than in fulfilling the prophecies of that suffering servant who gives himself for the iniquities of us all. He also presents himself as the authoritative son of man. Son of man is an interesting term, perhaps referring to his living in the flesh, incarnate, as we say, but a phrase that occurs in a smattering of symbolic text in the Old Testament prophets that seems to have been used a lot in some of the non-inspired literature, religious literature between the Old and New Testament period, time, period of time. But Jesus seems to appropriate it. It hadn't been pinned down specifically to mean anything before then. It had been used in various contexts. But he frequently refers himself to, as, to himself as the Son of Man, which relates him, of course, to humanity. But he also makes it very clear that the Son of Man, and this reflects Old Testament prophets, is the one who will ultimately return in glory. So Jesus brings wonderful spiritual blessings to his people, but he also promises eternal reward or punishment based on whether people do the will of God. And he identifies himself as the prophesied one who will lay down his life for people's sins. And in addition, he is the son of man, but that son of man is going to return in glory. Jesus also teaches who people are meant to be. People are children of God. Each person coming into this world is a child of God because he created our first ancestors. He treats us all as his children. He is a loving heavenly father who knows us intimately. He's a forgiving father who when we go astray would welcome us back like the prodigal son's father did. He is both father and sovereign to those who enter the kingdom of God, to those who submit to his rule. He is both our father and our king. The Bible also presents people, the Bible, the preaching of Jesus, also presents people as complex created beings. And God values each person as his creation. And if you think about the greatest command, and as is expressed slightly different words from place to place, in the teaching of Jesus, we become again aware that people are a complex combination of heart and mind, strength, soul and spirit and will. And God recognizes that those are so intertwined in us that he expects us to love him with that whole intertwined person, with all that we are. That is very much in the teaching of Jesus. And yet, it is a part of the teaching of Jesus that people are sinners who need forgiveness. Jesus in no way belittles sin, 
but he shows compassion to sinners. In fact, his critics would accuse him of being a friend of sinners. He was a friend of sinners, but he called them to repent for forgiveness. On the other hand, for people who would ignore their sins, for people who would reject his word, Jesus severely condemned the sinners. Jesus teaches how people are meant to live. To use one of his well-known phrases, people are meant to find rest for the soul by serving Jesus. Those who serve Jesus reject shallow versions of the meaning of life. Life is not about accumulating wealth or prestige or achieving religious recognition. Life is not about getting all we want or even about making our mark in life about how much we've accomplished. His servants know a deeper meaning of life. Life is about self-denial for the sake of Christ. Self-denial is another concept that we all need to keep learning all of our lives. What is it that you could have been doing to make it better in the world, to be more famous, to be more personally fulfilled, all of those things that we might do that are selfish. How, what if that do you set aside so that you can serve Christ? To those who serve Jesus, life is about living as a subject in the kingdom of God. The teaching of Jesus, the meaning of life, has two clear purposes. People are first to love God with the whole person, with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And secondly, you're to love neighbors as you love yourself. And to those who understand these basic truths about how people are meant to live. People are meant to live an abundant life. And with these views of life that Jesus teaches, it is an abundant life. In particular, Jesus teaches how to live in view of eternity. First of all, is a warning. Live aware that the world as we know it is coming to an end. The end will be as shocking as the upcoming destruction of Jerusalem that Jesus prophesied where the center of their whole world, Jerusalem, was just razed to the ground by the Romans some 40 years after Christ. Unbelievable to them that that could happen. At the same time that he talks about that, he tells us that the end will be at an unexpected time warns us that people will be easily confused when they see one world crisis after another, natural disaster or war, and people will say, this must be the end of the world. And Jesus says, nobody knows when it's going to be. So a warning of Jesus, live aware that the world as we know it, history will end. This world will be gone. You just don't know when. Secondly, positively, to live in view of eternity is to live with assurance that Jesus will return in the end. It's going to be seen by everybody. He's going to descend from the clouds with angels. 
He's going to receive his faithful people for eternal life. If you're on his side, if you're subject to his will, if you're serving him, doing God's will, then in the end, Jesus is going to take you home forever. There's another side to that. Living in view of eternity means that you live with respect for facing Jesus on Judgment Day. In the end, Jesus will initiate the resurrection of all people. He says the righteous will rise to eternal life. And the unrighteous will rise to eternal condemnation. Judgment is pictured as a day where Jesus will separate all the people like a shepherd separates the sheep and the goats. And then he'll judge them according to the deeds done in the body. So we end on a somber note, but that's not all there is. There's great hope to those who will obey. There is great meaning in life to those who will understand. There is knowledge of God to those who will listen. And there is a father who can be our ruler, who is always right and always powerful and always ready to forgive. These are teachings of Jesus.